This happened to me in 2010. I'd moved up to Alaska after my wife passed. Figured the solitude would suit me. Got me a cabin outside of Anchorage, deep in the Chugach Mountains. Name's Harlan, Harlan Scott if you really care. Start was good. Fishing, long hikes, that kind of peace you only find when the nearest neighbor is miles away. But Alaska's got its own kind of quiet. Not peaceful, but like, waiting. It seeps into you, makes the hair on your neck prickle. It started with my dog, Samson. Big shepherd, brave as they come. One night, he just refused to go out, not even for food. Started whining, cowered near the back door. Figured he picked up a scent of a bear or something. Happens. But it became a nightly battle. Never seen him act that way. Then the tracks. Found them behind the woodshed. Big, misshapen, no animal I recognized. Put it down to maybe a mutated moose. Tried to tell myself I was getting spooked over nothing. The dreams came next. Not nightmares, exactly. Just being watched. Feeling a cold, hungry presence right at the edge of my vision. Woke up sweating. The silence of the cabin suddenly feeling heavy, oppressive. One early morning, maybe a week later, Samson let out a bark and bolted into the woods. Figured he finally caught wind of that damn moose. Didn't find hide nor hair of him all day. At dusk, heard a howl cut through the air. Long, mournful, nothing like a wolf. My blood ran cold, because under that howl I heard a whimper, like a dog in pain. Never saw Samson again. Next morning, I went out armed. It was more than finding my dog, it was about ending whatever killed him. Figured that thing wouldn't be too far, full from its feast. Followed the tracks deep into a ravine. Lost them at a stream, like whatever made them just stepped into the water and vanished. Spent the better part of the day scouring that ravine, rifle at the ready. Nothing. Then walking back, movement caught my eye. On the edge of the tree line, there it was. Bigger than I thought. Hunched over with grayish, mangy fur. Humanoid, in a way that made my skin crawl. Head was long, snout stretched out, and those eyes, yellow, like dying embers. Took a shot. Not sure if I hit it or if it ducked into the trees. Figured cornering it was a fool's errand. Thing knew the terrain, was probably toying with me. Hightailed it back to the cabin. That night, the silence wasn't just quiet, it throbbed. I boarded up windows, checked every latch, loaded the shotgun with buckshot. Tried to tell myself it was my nerves, that I was a grown man scared of shadows. The noise woke me. A scraping, tapping sound like claws on the roof. My heart pounded in my ears. It circled the cabin, the tapping shifting from the roof to the windows, interspersed with a rasping growl that chilled me to the bone. Then, a single gunshot rang out. Silence. Didn't dare hope, but I waited until dawn. Crept outside, and there, sprawled at the foot of a tree, was the creature. Dead bullet wound straight between its eyes. Never saw hide nor hair of whoever saved my bacon that night. But let me tell you, I didn't stick around to play host. Packed up what I could carry, drove to the nearest town, and sold the cabin for a pittance. Reckon folks think I'm crazy. Maybe I am. Maybe I imagined the whole damn thing. Grief for my lost dog warping my mind but when I get that prickle on the back of my neck, when I see those damn yellow eyes in every flicker of shadow, I know it ain't so simple. The sheriff up there found some weird reports over the years. Missing hunters, livestock torn apart in ways that don't fit any predator they know. Nobody makes the connection, not in a place with bears and wolverines. But I know better. Heard a story the other day, a hiker gone missing around Denali. That's a ways from the Chugach, but a chill went down my spine all the same. Figure those things move on when the pickings get slim. I keep the shotgun loaded by the door. Mostly, it makes me feel safe. But some nights, I look out at the darkness pressing from the tree line 
and I feel that old, primal fear creep up again. A fear that whispers, they ain't done. That thing in the ravine, it wasn't alone. And maybe, just maybe, it's got its hungry eyes on a new hunting ground. This happened to me on July 23, 2014 up in the Pacific Northwest. You know the forests there, the deep old ones that swallow you whole. I like it quiet, so I found work fixing up a remote cabin on an overgrown logging property near Mount Rainier National Park. Name's Ezekiel, Ezekiel Dunn. I'm used to solitude, and the pay was decent. Cabin was rougher than I expected, but I was there to work, not vacation. No internet, spotty cell service, the good stuff. Generator ran the lights and power tools, but at night it was just me and the darkness. Now, I'm experienced enough to know that most of the noises out there at night are just critters or the wind playing tricks. You adapt, learn to live with the wild. But this, this was something else. First few nights, everything seemed normal. Then came the sounds like something big circling the cabin after dark and the occasional thump against the old wooden walls. I saw tracks one morning, bigger than any cat or bear print I'd ever encountered. Didn't add up with anything I knew. Found myself doing that thing folks do, dismissing my own senses. Tried to convince myself it was my imagination or some local messing with the new guy. But then I got a good look at the thing. I'd gone into town for supplies, came back that afternoon. As I got out of my truck, I heard a crash from the woods behind the cabin. That's when I saw it, tall, maybe eight feet, crouched near the tree line. Its form was almost human, but not quite. The arms were too long, the shape of its head was wrong, and it moved in an uncanny, jerking way. My blood ran cold. This thing was no bear or hoax. It stared at me. I remember its eyes, a vivid yellow in the deepening twilight, and then it vanished into the forest with astonishing speed, left me shaking there with a truck full of groceries I barely had the strength to haul inside. Spent that night with an axe next to the bed and barricades on the doors and windows. Didn't sleep a wink. At dawn, I found more massive tracks circling the cabin. Something out there was hunting me. I should have left then, driven back to town and never looked back. But I'd already put in too much work, and I wasn't the type to run from something unknown. Instead, I set up a defensive perimeter, rigged makeshift traps around the property, and waited. It came back, two nights later. I was ready this time, shotgun loaded and nerves like steel wires. Heard the sound of the snares I'd set being triggered. A harsh metallic snap echoing through the trees, followed by that guttural roar. It didn't sound angry, more frustrated. The cabin shook as the creature hit the wall, trying to find a way inside. It circled the building, probing for a weakness. My hands were slick with sweat on the shotgun, but I held steady. Through a crack in the curtains, I caught a glimpse of the beast again. This time I got a clearer look. Thick, grayish hide, muscular shoulders, and a head with a blunt muzzle and those glowing eyes. It was both monstrous and strangely familiar, like a predator from some forgotten nightmare. I realized then this thing wasn't some escaped zoo animal or undiscovered species. It was something older, wilder, a creature that belonged to that ancient forest and resented my presence. The assault lasted hours. I fired the shotgun twice, more to scare it off than anything, and the blasts did seem to make it hesitate. When dawn approached, it withdrew for good, leaving deep gouges in the cabin walls and a trail of broken traps in its wake. Next morning, I called in sick, saying it was a bear attack. Didn't mention the rest. Packed up and hauled my gear up to a highway hitched a ride to the nearest bus station, and never returned. Months later, I came across an article online about a search-and-rescue team going missing near Mount Rainier. 
no bodies were ever found. They blamed it on the rough terrain, a wild animal attack maybe. But I knew better. I saw more than enough out there to know some things are better left alone, some corners of the woods where man's not meant to tread. Sometimes, the true horrors aren't what we imagine, but what lurks just beyond the edge of our understanding. Let's just say I don't fix up remote cabins anymore. This happened to me on October 12, 2010. Backwoods of Maine, family cabin, my wife's idea of a getaway. I'm more of a city guy. Give me a cramped apartment over spooky forests any day. Name's Malcolm, Malcolm Price. But my wife, Cassie, loves the outdoors. So here we were. First few days weren't bad. Bit boring, honestly. Did some fishing, hiking, typical woodsy stuff. Cabin was rustic. No Wi-Fi, my version of hell, but cozy enough. Things got weird when we made friends with the neighbors. Locals, a grizzled older man named Zeke and his grandson Billy. Billy was about 17, quiet sort but seemed harmless. Zeke creeped me out though, had these dead flinty eyes in a way of just staring. One night, sitting around the campfire, Zeke started telling stories. Local lore, mostly ghost tales, which I thought were just for show. Got my attention, though, when he started describing this creature that supposedly stalked the deep woods. Called it a wendigo. Some kind of twisted spirit, born of hunger and desperation, all antlers and rotten flesh. Said it could mimic voices, lure folks into the trees. Cassie laughed, thinking it was all just local color. Me? Well, it spooked me good. A few nights later, I woke up needing a drink. Heard a sound coming from the edge of the clearing. Thought it might be some deer, so I peeked out the window. What I saw will haunt me forever. Standing in the moonlight was the biggest damn deer you could imagine. But it wasn't right. Its legs were too long, gnarled like tree branches, antlers too wide, and its eyes... God, those eyes glowed with a sickly green light. I just froze, too terrified to move. Then it let out this bone-chilling shriek, a mournful wail that was part animal, part human, and all wrong. The creature vanished into the trees, but I didn't sleep a wink after that. Next morning, found tracks all around the cabin, enormous hoof prints, unlike anything I'd ever seen. Cassie was convinced it was a prank, some moose on the loose. I started thinking Zeke wasn't so crazy after all those stories of his. The next few days were a blur of escalating terror. That night, we heard it again, the wailing echoing through the woods. Then, on the porch the morning after, we found the carcass of a rabbit gutted with unnatural precision, like surgical cuts rather than something torn apart by an animal. My doubt faded replaced by icy fear. Something wasn't right in those woods. I told Cassie we had to leave. She was getting worried too, but wasn't convinced we were in mortal danger, just wanted to get some distance. We started packing, but it was too late. We heard Zeke's truck pull up the gravel drive that afternoon. He was alone, which was weird since he and Billy were inseparable. Out of options, I invited him in for coffee trying to gauge his mood, but he was acting even stranger than usual. Kept glancing past me, towards the window facing the woods, a tense look on his face. You seen Billy? He asked, his voice scratchy. I said I hadn't. Zeke took a gulp of coffee, his hand shaking so bad the mug rattled on the saucer. Just then, we heard a crash from outside, something slamming against the back of the cabin. Cassie screamed and I ran to the window. There, halfway up the back wall, was Billy. But he wasn't right. All lanky limbs, skin stretched too tight, his eyes blazing that same unnatural green as the creature I'd seen in the clearing. He let out a screech that set my teeth on edge. Then he jumped, landing inhumanly far from the cabin and disappearing into the woods. 
Zeke was on his feet, a rifle appearing in his hands as if from nowhere. He turned to us, a desperate look in those flinty eyes. That thing took him, he rasped. That damn Wendigo took my boy. I didn't know what the hell was going on, but we were in danger. Grabbed Cassie's hand, yelling for her to get to the truck. She didn't need telling twice. I heard Zeke's rifle blast echo behind us as we scrambled towards the battered old vehicle, the taste of copper fear thick in my mouth. The engine roared to life. I floored the gas pedal, spraying gravel in our wake as we tore down the drive. Could see Zeke in the rearview mirror getting smaller, his hunched form a solitary silhouette against the looming tree line. Then, a blood-curdling howl pierced the air, and something huge, impossibly fast, burst from the woods, leaping towards us. I slammed the accelerator, the truck lurching forward. In the rearview mirror, I caught a glimpse of the creature. It was a monstrous tangle of limbs and antlers, eyes burning with malevolent hunger. More of Billy seemed gone with each passing second, the Wendigo's influence consuming him. And somehow, impossibly, it was gaining on us. Cassie screamed, clutching the dashboard as I desperately swerved to avoid the trees, hemming in the rough track. Branches lashed against the truck, but the flimsy doors were no match for whatever relentless power drove that thing. The howling grew louder, closer, the reek of decay seeping through the cracked windows. Turn! Cassie yelled, pointing frantically towards a sharp bend that led deeper into the woods. It was a gamble, but careening down the main road seemed like certain death. I wrenched the wheel, tires squealing in protest as we shot off the main trail. My heart thrummed a frantic tattoo against my ribs. If the Wendigo couldn't chase us in a straight line, maybe we stood a chance of losing it. The dirt track narrowed, winding through dense undergrowth that threatened to tear the truck apart. With each thud and lurch, I feared the axle would snap, leaving us stranded at the mercy of that... that thing. But luck was on our side, at least for a few precious moments. The track veered sharply around a massive boulder, partially obscured by dense foliage. I punched the gas, praying the truck had enough clearance to make it. The maneuver was jarring. We barely squeezed through, the truck body scraping against the unforgiving stone. My eyes darted to the rearview mirror. The Wendigo was directly behind, but the boulder would slow it down, buy us some time. We careened forward, the track sloping downwards into a shadowy valley. A sliver of hope flickered in my chest. Maybe we could outpace it, reach the main road before it caught up. Then through the trees I saw a glint of water, a river, wide and fast-flowing, there was nowhere to go but forward. Hold on! I yelled at Cassie. The truck plowed down the incline, branches snapping as we gained speed. Then the world turned into a blur of green and brown and rushing blue. I held my breath, braced for impact as we plunged over the bank and into the icy water. The shock was brutal, the truck groaning in protest as the current caught it. We bobbed violently then started to drift downstream. Frantically, I turned the key in the ignition, the engine sputtering then roaring back to life. Somehow the damn thing was still running. Looking back, I saw the Wendigo loping along the riverbank, its furious snarls echoing over the rushing water. It wasn't giving up, but it couldn't reach us, bound to the land as we were swept relentlessly along. Kilometers passed. Cassie and I clung to each other, shivering in our soaked clothes. Finally, the terrain flattened and the river widened. I angled the truck towards a break in the trees, the engine groaning as we struggled up the bank. We lurched onto solid ground, the wheels spinning madly in the mud for a terrifying moment. Then we were free. I kept driving until the sun began to peek over the horizon. Exhaustion clawed at me, but I didn't dare stop. Finally, a sign of civilization a gas station gleaming like an oasis. I pulled over, my legs shaking as I stumbled out of the truck. We called the cops, but our story of monsters and mythical creatures earned us wary glances and hushed whispers about shock. 
We left the truck at the gas station, bought bus tickets, and never looked back at that accursed stretch of woods. To this day, I don't know what became of Zeke or the creature that had been his grandson. Some secrets are best left buried. The aftermath is a tangle of scars and sleepless nights. Cassie and I stuck together, the shared ordeal forging an unbreakable bond. We moved far away from the backwoods, the bustle of the city a balm to our traumatized souls. The sound of the wind rustling through trees still sends shivers down my spine, and I've never looked at a deer the same way again. Zeke was labeled a lunatic by the authorities, his warnings about a wendigo dismissed as the ravings of a grief-stricken old man. Billy was officially declared missing, his disappearance another unsolved mystery attributed to the inherent dangers of the wilderness. Some nights, when the city noise subsides, I can almost hear the mournful wail of that corrupted creature, a chilling reminder of the unknowable horrors that lurk on the fringes of our world. Folks say the woods are just woods, full of ordinary creatures. And that's probably true most of the time. But sometimes the veil between the normal and the monstrous wears thin. And in those dark and forgotten corners, things with ancient hungers stir, their eyes gleaming with an intelligence as alien as it is terrifying. So listen close when the wind carries an echo of inhuman sorrow, for that may be the only warning you get that you've wandered too far from the path and onto the hunting grounds of something far, far older than man. This happened to me on July 4th, 1999. I was living in a little cabin nestled deep back in the Ozark Mountain Forests in Arkansas. The place had been passed down to me by my grandpa, used to love spending summers there with him. Now, after leaving the military, I wanted some quiet to adjust to civilian life again. Name's Carter. Carter Reynolds. Most days were laid back. I fished the nearby lake, hiked, fixed up the cabin. Nights, I'd sit out on the porch watching for deer. I always had my grandpa's old .30, 30 rifle nearby, but I rarely used it. Just comforting to have, I guess. That holiday weekend, the old Peterson place, down the mountain a little way, had some visitors. It was a brother and sister, both older than me, with two kids running wild. I'd seen them around a few times, but we kind of kept to ourselves out there. The night of the 4th, they had a bonfire and fireworks going. The noise wasn't my favorite, but they were far enough away that it didn't bother me too much. I was sitting out on my porch, watching the flashes light up the sky, when I heard something big scrambling through the woods off to my right. A bear. Those weren't uncommon, but they usually stuck closer to the lake. Didn't want the noise and trouble with some kids around, though, so I grabbed my grandpa's rifle just in case and stepped down onto the grass. It had been dry, so the leaves and underbrush were making even more noise than usual. Then I saw it. Not a bear. Far too tall. Its form hunched, massive, and covered in dark, coarse hair. It poked its ugly head out from behind a thick oak tree, and its eyes caught the moonlight. They were red. I'd never seen eyes like that on any animal I recognized. I froze, heart pounding. Hadn't even bothered raising the rifle yet. This wasn't a bear, and I didn't know what the hell it was. Maybe something sick or injured. It watched me, its head tilted to one side like it was sizing me up. Then, it was gone, vanishing back into the tree line. I stood there, stunned. Fireworks echoed faintly from the Peterson's place. What the hell had that been? I slowly lifted the rifle hand shaking a bit. Should I head back inside? I hesitated. If a bear was snooping around, folks needed to know, especially with kids out here. I turned towards the distant bonfire, squinting to make out shadowy figures through the darkness. Then the screaming started. My stomach dropped. A shriek from one of the kids, a woman yelling, and a deep guttural roar that wasn't from any animal I knew. I bolted in the direction of the noise, the rifle heavy in my hands. 
fireworks forgotten, every instinct now focused on whatever was down there. As I got closer, the commotion intensified. I could hear the man shouting, the sister, whose name I think was Melissa, pleading. And between them, the growls and snarls, inhuman, monstrous. I charged into the clearing and froze. The creature was huge, far bigger than I had gauged from the quick glimpse earlier. It was crouched over something. No, someone. The little boy. He was screaming, scrabbling backward, trying to escape the long, clawed fingers that swiped at his legs. The adults were circling the creature, throwing rocks and shouting, trying to distract it from the child. And there in its arms was the other kid. The girl. My breath hitched in my throat. She was limp, head lolling to the side, streaked with blood. I leveled the rifle. One shot to take it down. That's all I had time for. The .30, 30 bucked against my shoulder, filling the woods with its blast. The creature roared in pain, whipping its head around. It dropped the little girl and staggered, clutching a mangled arm. The boy took his chance and wriggled backward with a final scream. Melissa rushed to the girl, cradling her. The man, what was his name? Tom? He was shouting at me, waving his arms towards the woods. Get out of here, run! But I couldn't leave them defenseless. I braced myself. The thing was hurt, but it wasn't going down easily. It raised its head, and those red eyes fixed on me. Then, in a blur, it rushed me. I fired again, but in the dim light, my shot went wide. It was too close. I had almost no time to react. I swung the rifle butt up, knocking aside a huge clawed hand that reached for my throat. Pain exploded in my shoulder. With one swipe, the creature carved long gashes across my chest, sending me tumbling to the ground. My vision blurred. It hunched over me, drool dripping from its enormous sharp-toothed maw. I could smell its hot, rancid breath. This was it. I was gonna die in the dirt, ripped to shreds by some unholy beast in the Ozark backwoods. A stupid, gruesome way to go. Suddenly, another gunshot rang out. Not mine. The creature jerked back, howling. And then another shot, this one hitting its flank. Through my blurred vision, I saw Tom, holding a shotgun. His face was pale with terror, but he was focused. He fired again and again. With each blast, the creature wailed and staggered. The kids were still screaming. Melissa was sobbing over the little girl. Then Tom shouted something I couldn't make out and gestured for me to run. Adrenaline shot through me. I scrambled to my feet, ignoring the burning pain in my shoulder. Each step sent agony through my side, but I had to keep moving. I ran, stumbling through the darkness. The creature didn't pursue. Tom was yelling, firing, buying me time. I pushed through the woods, crashing blindly through branches. I had no idea if I was heading back towards my cabin or deeper into the wilderness. I had to get help. Had to warn anyone in the area that there was... something... out there. I finally stumbled upon the rough dirt road leading back to my place. My legs burned, my chest felt like it was on fire. I forced myself onward. Had to make it. Had to warn somebody. I don't know how long I ran. Time became a meaningless blur. Each ragged breath was a battle against the black edges creeping into my vision. Finally, I saw the familiar outline of my cabin. A surge of relief washed over me, pushing aside the pain for a few desperate moments. The front door swung open before I even reached the porch. I tried to explain, to yell something about the creature and the Peterson family, but words caught in my bleeding, burning throat. I collapsed against the doorframe. Then everything went dark. I woke in the hospital. My memory of the next few days is hazy. Doctors muttering, pain meds, the blur of concerned faces. Finally, a county sheriff with a thick Ozark accent sat by my bedside. He was a man named Grady, and he'd heard my rambling story the night I was brought in. At first, 
I think he wrote it off as delirium brought on by shock and blood loss. But something must have changed his mind. Turns out, Tom made it back to his place after the attack. The little girl, bless her soul, hadn't survived. He described the creature as well, matching every horrifying detail I could remember with chilling clarity. It left the sheriff rattled enough to launch a search. He took me and Tom seriously, I suppose. He called in reinforcements, even alerted the National Guard. They went in strong to those woods, armed to the teeth. Tracked it for two days straight, never found a trace. No fur, no blood, no body. Nothing to justify the hunt or explain what was out there. Grady came to see me again, an apologetic frown on his face. His folks thought I was crazy, probably. Tom was, too, for believing me. But Grady, he saw the look in my eyes. He knew. My body mended, but the scars remained, not just the physical ones across my shoulder and chest, but the deeper scars that lurked beneath the surface. I never went back to my cabin, sold it as soon as I could get out of that hospital bed, never set foot in the Ozarks again. Some nights I still see those red eyes, feel those claws raking across my skin. Word was the Petersons left too, disappeared out of the area, never heard from them since. People think it was a bear attack. Wild animal got spooked by all the fireworks and lashed out. Or maybe a mountain lion that strayed out of its normal range. That's the official story, the easier one to believe. But I know what was out there. And I know that the people who write off these tales, who label them as crazy or tall tales, haven't seen what lurks in the shadows. It isn't always explainable. It isn't always a bear or a deranged person. Sometimes, the truth is far more terrifying than we're ready to admit. The news reports dried up, life moved on, but I kept track, obsessively searching local news feeds for years, watching for any hint of strange occurrences, any missing persons reports in the Ozarks. Nothing. I never found a description that matched the creature, never heard a whisper about another sighting. Maybe the guard got it. Maybe it crawled off somewhere to die, or maybe it's still out there, waiting, watching. And some poor soul, camping out on a night like that 4th of July years ago, might stumble into its path and never be heard from again. This happened to me on July 17th, 1993. I was staying at a buddy's cabin up in rural Maine. Beautiful, dense woods, the kind where the trees blot out the sun at midday. He'd needed help with repairs, and I was always up for some time away from the city. My name's Harris. One morning I went for a hike in the woods. Deep in those parts, you don't find trails or nothing. Just you and the trees. Had my pack, a walking stick, my dad's old hunting knife at my belt. I was used to the wild, but still, always best to be prepared. Something felt off after a couple hours of walking. Too quiet. No birds, no critters rustling in the bushes. You get used to the sounds, or the absence of them. I stopped and listened, that sixth sense you develop in nature starting to prickle. Then... I heard a snap of a twig behind me. I spun around. At first I saw nothing, just the shadows and the thick tangle of trees. Then it stepped into a clearing, about thirty feet away. It was massive, bipedal, easily seven feet tall and covered in long, matted brown fur. The head was... I still struggled to find the words, almost like a wolf but misshapen. The muzzle stretched out and the jaw hung slack. It tilted its head, and I saw the eyes, blood red, pure and unblinking. I froze, one hand reaching slowly for the knife. I didn't know if I could run, if it would chase. I didn't want to find out. We stood there for what felt like hours, 
me and this unnatural beast locked in some silent staring contest. The air felt heavy, charged, every muscle in my body tensed, ready to run or fight, or be killed. Then, without warning, it let out a low, guttural growl, a sound that crawled under my skin and settled in my stomach like a cold stone. And then it was gone, disappearing into the trees with shocking speed for something its size. I don't know how long I stood there shaking. When I could finally move, I headed back for the cabin, walking fast, not looking behind me. That night, I told my buddy, his name was Caleb, what I'd seen. Figured he'd laugh. He was from up there, had to know some local legend matching the description. He didn't laugh. Got real serious, looked out into the night, chewing his lip. Took a long swig of beer before he spoke. Folks around here, some know the old stories passed down. Think it's all made-up tales. Except, every now and then, something happens. Hunter goes missing. Cattle mutilated. Sightings in the deep woods. They call it... The Dogman. Dogman, I echoed. More of a breath than a word. It sounded like something from a bad horror movie. But looking at Caleb's pale face... There was no mistaking the fear beneath the bravado. Ain't nothing natural about it, that's for sure. Some kind of spirit, maybe. Or, uh, something else. I don't mess around in them woods at night. That's all I'm saying. The next few days were tense. We stuck together, kept the guns loaded, and didn't venture far. Then, on our last night, Caleb decided to throw a small campfire party out back couple of his other buddies coming over. It was stupid, I know, but we were trying to blow off steam, act like things were normal. I even managed a laugh or two, but that primal fear never truly left, and as the night deepened, it bubbled back to the surface stronger than ever. Around midnight, we heard a crash from the tree line, followed by a scream. One of Caleb's friends, a girl named Tessa, we all scrambled to our feet, guns ready. Caleb swore, grabbed a flashlight, and charged toward the noise. I followed, heart pounding like a drum in my chest. When we reached the edge of the woods, Caleb's light swept the darkness. At first, all I saw were fallen branches and Tessa, curled on the ground and crying. We rushed over to her. Then I saw the blood and the tracks. Huge footprints. Not human, not bare. Something that walked on two legs but had claws that dug deep into the earth. Caleb turned, face illuminated by the flashlight beam, and for the first time, I saw real terror in his eyes. We didn't need to say it. The dogman was back. We got Tessa inside, locked the doors, and huddled in the living room with the lights blazing. I didn't know what else to do but grip the shotgun by the fireplace and try to stay calm, knowing it was probably useless. The rest of the night was filled with noises, growls, the rasping of something heavy against the cabin walls, thuds on the roof. Every second felt like an hour, the terror slowly choking the life out of us. By dawn, the sounds had faded. We waited, every nerve on edge, until the sun dipped above the trees. Only then did Caleb dare open the door. His face was grim, etched with sleepless exhaustion and cold terror. Tessa's car was nowhere to be seen. We ventured out cautiously, following the tracks that led away from the cabin and back into the depths of the woods. They stopped abruptly a few hundred yards in. No sign of a struggle. No more blood. Just an uncanny feeling of emptiness, like whatever had been there was simply... gone vanished back into the wilderness from whence it came. We stumbled back to the cabin, shell-shocked and desperate to get as far away from that place as possible. We reported Tessa as missing. The police questioned us, thoroughly confused by our descriptions of the tracks, the noises we'd heard. Animal attack was the official explanation, though anyone who glanced at Caleb's face knew even he didn't quite believe that. They searched the woods, of course, but found nothing. Tessa became another name on those missing posters you see at gas stations. 
fading into a statistic. Caleb moved away shortly after. Couldn't blame him. The dog man had broken something in him, tarnished the childhood innocence he still clung to. I never saw him again, never even heard from him. Figured he changed his name, disappeared into some city, tried to forget what lurked in those main woods. I stuck around longer. Didn't make sense, except that stubborn part of me wanted answers. I studied local lore, read those old newspaper clippings about strange deaths and disappearances. Turns out, tales of the dogman were as old as the town itself, and they all seemed to follow a strange pattern. A cluster of sightings, a missing person, then silence. For decades sometimes, I became obsessed, consumed with trying to understand the creature, to predict its return. I armed myself to the teeth, spent nights wandering the woods, armed with my old hunting rifle and a growing arsenal of increasingly high-powered weaponry. Never slept more than a few hours at a time, constantly alert, constantly braced for attack. It became my own private war in those shadowed woods. People thought I was crazy. The town outcast, the nutter who whispered about monsters others pretended weren't real. Maybe they were right. Maybe in my pursuit of the truth, I lost something essential in myself. Then, a few years later, it came back. Reports started trickling in. A slaughtered deer carcass, found in a way that no wolf or mountain lion would have left it. Hikers on the outskirts of town, hearing noises in the trees, swearing they were being watched. And that creeping sense of unease settling over the entire area once again. One night, I woke in my run-down trailer to the sound of scratching at the door. I knew it before I even reached for the rifle. When I looked out the window, those red eyes gleamed back, reflecting the moonlight. The dog man had returned. And this time, I was ready. The fight was indescribable. A blur of fur and teeth, the crack of rifle shots, the thick, coppery smell of blood that wasn't mine. At some point, I lost the gun, ending up on my back, wrestling those impossibly strong claws away from my throat. It was pure animal instinct, fueled by years of fear and hatred. It ended with my dad's hunting knife buried up to the hilt in its chest. Not a clean kill. It howled, shuddered, then lay still. The eyes, once filled with predatory fire, dimmed and then went lifeless. And for the first time, I got a good, close look at what I'd been fighting. It was horrific. Not just animal, but not fully... anything I recognized. Like a grotesque experiment gone wrong a twisted mockery of life itself. A wave of nausea swept over me, the adrenaline crash leaving me trembling with disgust and fear. When the sheriff and the park rangers arrived, drawn by the gunshots, all that was left was the body. They didn't believe my story, of course. Took me in for questioning, checked me into a psych ward for a while. I didn't fight it. Letting them believe I was unstable meant they'd leave me alone. I stayed in town, despite it all. Couldn't stomach the thought of running away like Caleb did. This was my fight now. I became the keeper of the secret, the protector against the thing in the shadows. People still saw me as the crazy guy, and maybe I was. But they slept safe in their houses, unaware of the true horrors lurking just beyond the reach of their porch lights. Some nights, I still walked the woods, keeping watch. The dogman, or whatever it was, never came back. At least, not that I've seen. But I know one thing for sure. The next time the whispers of disappearances and strange sightings start, the next time that old fear prickles at the back of the town's neck, I'll be there, waiting. This happened to me on October 12th, 2008, hunting season in full swing up in the rugged mountains of Colorado. I used to love it, good excuse to get some quiet time in my little cabin on some family land. 
That year, it felt different. My name's Wyatt. Morning of opening day, I'd been out for a couple hours, hadn't seen a single deer, and worse, barely even heard any birds, no squirrels making a ruckus. It felt off, like the whole wood was holding its breath. I shrugged it off at first, part of the hunter's paranoia, I guess. Around noon, I decided to head further up the slopes, see if my luck changed. Found myself following what looked like deer tracks, but they seemed off, too big, too widely spaced. Then I spotted something on the ground. Blood. A lot of blood. That's when the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. A bad feeling hit me like a ton of bricks. Some predator got to a deer, I figured. Maybe a cougar. Had my rifle ready just in case. Followed the tracks and blood, pushing through thick bushes until I came into a small clearing. And that's when I saw the body, or what was left of it. It was a deer, but savaged, torn almost in half. Huge gashes in its flesh, like something with massive claws had raked it open. No cougar could do that. A bear, maybe. But it felt wrong. All wrong. Whatever killed this deer, it wanted to kill it. Suddenly a noise made me freeze, a branch cracking behind me. I spun around, rifle raised, and it stepped out of the trees. My first coherent thought was that I must have lost my mind because nobody would believe this. This thing. It was huge, at least eight feet tall standing on its hind legs. It was fur covered, but the fur was patchy and matted, revealing some kind of dark, leathery skin underneath. Its face was... I can't even describe it. Long, snout-like, with rows of sharp, jagged teeth dripping with saliva. But the eyes, they were worst of all. Blood red and burning with a hunger that sent chills down my spine. It let out a low, menacing growl, the rumbling vibration of it rattling through me to my core. Then it stood up, forelimbs tipped with claws the size of my hunting knife. I fired my rifle. The deafening blast echoed through the trees, but I don't think I hit it. It screeched, a high-pitched, ear-splitting sound, then lunged forward. I threw myself backwards, scrambling for purchase in the loose dirt of the clearing. The creature landed where I'd been standing, claws ripping into the ground. I fired again, this one more of a lucky shot, as I fumbled with the bolt action. It stumbled, roared, then it turned and disappeared. The whole encounter lasted maybe ten seconds, but it felt like a lifetime. I lay there, gasping for air, my whole body trembling. When I could finally stand, I realized I was clutching a chunk of its fur in my fist. It was coarse, wiry, with the same rotten smell you find around dead animals on the road. This thing wasn't natural, not an animal I recognized. I stumbled back down the trail to my cabin. As I walked, my mind raced. What the hell was that? Part of me still expected to wake up, realize it was a horrible nightmare. Found my landline, hands still shaking as I dialed the sheriff's office. They sounded skeptical, figured I was a drunk hunter seeing things. Told them to head to my coordinates. They'd find the deer carcass and proof I wasn't lying. By the time the deputy arrived, the sun was dipping below the mountains. He surveyed the scene with a grim expression. The remains of the deer were even more gruesome in the twilight, the blood almost black against the snow-dusted ground. Can't say I've ever seen anything do this to an animal, he muttered, more to himself than me. I handed him the tuft of fur. He examined it, turning it in the fading light. Just then, a howl shattered the silence, a long, mournful cry that chilled me to the bone. It echoed off the mountains, seeming to come from everywhere at once. The deputy and I exchanged a look. That wasn't a coyote. That wasn't... anything normal. Let's get back to your cabin, he said, voice tense. I'm calling in for backup. That night, huddled indoors with all the lights blazing, we waited. The woods were alive with rustles, strange snaps and creaks, and that bone-chilling howl coming again 
and again. The backup never arrived. Turns out, the nearest unit got called away to some kind of domestic disturbance hours away. We were alone. The deputy was a local, knew folks who had disappearances over the years. Hikers, the occasional rancher foolish enough to venture out too far. Whispers in the local bars about strange creatures sighted. Rumors never reported officially. We're not dealing with something normal out there, he said, gripping his shotgun a little tighter. As dawn approached, the noises faded, leaving us with a heavy silence. I packed what I could, grabbed my grandpa's old pistol and loaded it with shaking hands. I wasn't planning on running, but if that thing came back, well, I wasn't going down without a fight. The deputy radioed for assistance again, gave my coordinates, and grimly informed them he wasn't sure how long we'd hold out. He wanted to try and reach a neighboring property but didn't want to leave me alone. We spent what felt like an eternity waiting in that cabin. Every creak of the old wooden structure, every rustling of leaves outside, set my teeth on edge. The deputy paced, checking the windows every few minutes. Late that morning, I heard the unmistakable sound of a helicopter. Relief surged through me. I'd never been so happy to hear that chopping rhythmic beat, but as the sound grew louder, my relief turned to dread. Something was wrong with the noise. It was too rough, accompanied by a high-pitched whine and muffled thumps. The deputy and I rushed outside in time to see the helicopter spiraling wildly. It was clipping the treetops, blades wobbling dangerously. I saw dark shapes clinging to its sides, silhouettes against the sky. Then it happened. One of the creatures, the same type I had fought in the clearing, ripped huge chunks from the helicopter's body, metal peeling like tinfoil. The helicopter lurched, the pilot desperately struggling to control it. It smashed into the trees, exploding in a fireball that shook the ground. Smoke and flames billowed up, and the screams echoed in the silence that followed. We were on our own. The rest of the day was a blur of panic and grim determination. We fortified the cabin as best we could, barricading windows and doors. I checked the ammo, grimly realizing it wouldn't last long if multiple creatures attacked. The deputy was a good man. Name was Rhodes. He kept a level head, even as the knowledge settled in that we were probably going to die up here. As night fell, those terrible howls started up again closer this time. Our defenses wouldn't hold. We both knew it. Rhodes made a decision. We can't stay here. We'll be sitting ducks, he said, his voice thick. He had a plan, a crazy one, but it might be our only chance. We snuck out the back, moving silently into the woods. The howls were coming from the south. We headed north, praying the creatures were distracted. Miles turned into an eternity of stumbling through the darkness, clinging to the hope that Rhodes knew a way out we didn't. Just when I thought my legs would give out, we broke through the tree line, and I saw it. A dirt road winding along the base of the mountain. It seemed impossible in that moment, like a mirage. But Rhodes squeezed my shoulder. Old logging access barely used anymore. Then we picked up the pace, running for our lives. Behind us, the howls were getting closer. I heard the crashing of trees, their heavy footfalls pounding the ground, shaking it with each step. We reached the road just as the first creature burst into view. I raised my pistol, firing more in desperation than any true aim. The shots didn't seem to do anything, but perhaps it stalled them for a crucial second. More emerged from the trees, three of them, massive loping figures in the moonlight. Rhodes grabbed my arm and pulled me along. The road! Find a vehicle! Anything! He shouted, his voice hoarse. We sprinted down the road, the creatures in full pursuit now, their guttural growls raising goosebumps all over my body. My lungs burned, my legs screamed. Then I saw it, an old rusted-out pickup truck, half buried in a ditch. Rhodes reached the truck first, heaving himself into the driver's seat. No keys in the ignition. He swore, 
then started ripping wires from under the dash, fingers flying. I risked a look behind us. The creatures were gaining fast, their eyes burning red in the darkness. If we didn't get out of there... The engine sputtered and coughed, then roared to life. I scrambled into the passenger side as Rhodes threw the truck into gear. Dirt flew as we peeled out of the ditch, bumping wildly down the road. Through the rear window I saw the creatures leaping onto the road, reaching for us with their monstrous claws. A few shots from Rhodes' shotgun made them duck for cover, buying us just enough time. We swerved and bounced along, praying the old truck held together. Then, as if a switch was flipped, the pursuit ended. The creatures stopped by the tree line, screeching and howling at us as we disappeared into the night. Had they given up? Was there some territorial limitation? I didn't care. All I knew was that for the moment, we were safe. We made it to the nearest town hours later, exhausted, covered in mud, and smelling like fear. Our story to the local police sounded insane, but there wasn't much they could do. No bodies of the creatures, the helicopter wreckage too remote to reach quickly. The deer carcass and my torn-up cabin proved something was out there, but not exactly what. Rhodes filled out a lengthy report, but both of us knew it'd get filed away under the crackpot category. They gave us blankets, coffee, the sympathetic but suspicious looks that said they thought we were delusional drunks or fugitives, maybe covering up the murder of the helicopter's crew. Didn't matter. We weren't going back up there. I never saw Rhodes again after that. Figured he put in for a transfer far away from those mountains, from the memories of the things he saw that night. Me, I sold the land. Cheap. Didn't even tell the buyers why. Let them think I was a fool, whatever. I just needed to get as far away as possible. Years have passed. I have a wife and kids now, life in a bustling suburb about as far removed from the wilderness as you can get. They've never heard the story, of course. My wife just thinks I don't like camping. And most of the time, I managed to convince myself it was a nightmare. A fever dream brought on by mountain solitude. But some nights, I hear a rustle in the bushes, catch a foul rotting whiff on the breeze. Or I'll see the glint of red eyes in the headlights of a passing car. And then I know, they're still out there. In the dark corners of the forests in the stories whispered around campfires, in the nightmares of those unfortunate enough to cross their path. This happened to me on July 7, 2003. I was staying in a cabin deep in the Chattahoochee National Forest. Georgia figured I'd get some writing done, enjoy the peace and solitude, my name's Wyatt, by the way. I write when I can. Used to have some short stories published back in the day, but the inspiration hasn't exactly flowed lately. Thought the woods would help change that. It was idyllic at first. Hiking by day, campfire at night, beer, a beat-up old guitar, the usual. One thing I'd always loved was how the night sounds out there are different. Not quiet, exactly but filled with those little rustles and chirps you don't get in the city, calming in a way, until they weren't. It started with, well, maybe nothing. A branch snapping louder than it should have, a shadow in the trees that my flashlight couldn't quite catch. I told myself it was deer, maybe a big raccoon at worst, but my skin started to crawl. Something felt asterisk off asterisk. The next night, I built my fire bigger than usual, piled the wood high, a beacon against the thick darkness of the forest. But even with the light, I couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. I tried playing the guitar, but my fingers fumbled on the strings. The old songs didn't sound right beneath those looming trees. Finally, I gave up and headed inside, locking the cabin door with a loud, defiant click. It felt childish, and a part of me knew it wouldn't keep anything out that Asterisk truly Asterisk wanted in. The cabin didn't even have cell service, and the nearest neighbor was miles away. 
If something happened, I was completely on my own. The night stretched on. I didn't sleep, just lay there listening. Then I heard it, faint at first, a scratching sound outside the window. My first thought was squirrel, but that faded fast. The scratching became heavy thumps. Something big was bumping against the cabin. I crept from my bed, grabbing a poker from the fireplace. My heart pounded in my chest, a trapped animal roar of adrenaline and fear. Slowly, I eased towards the window, the poker gripped in white-knuckled hands. It was pitch black outside, the moon hidden by thick clouds. But as my eyes adjusted, I saw a shape, massive. It stood as tall as a man, yet slumped forward, limbs too long. Fur clung in patches to its skin, revealing raw pink flesh streaked with what looked like burns. It was almost skeletal, ribs showing through. The head. That's what made my breath hitch. Not quite dog, not wolf. Something else. Eyes like green coals gleaming from a skull-like snout. It turned its head, and I saw it had teeth. Way too many teeth. Needles crammed into misaligned jaws. It pressed against the window and the glass groaned. Go away! I yelled, the sound weak even to my ears. I slammed the poker against the glass, but it didn't flinch. It let out a noise I'll never forget. Half howl, half something I can only describe as a laugh. And then, the unthinkable happened. The cabin door rattled. The heavy wooden door shook on its hinges, held shut only by the flimsy lock I'd engaged. The creature outside was trying to get in. I reacted without thinking, raced to the back of the cabin, where there was a small window facing the woods. I had to get out. I couldn't stay trapped with that thing. I fumbled with the latch, the sound of it clawing at the door echoing through the cabin. With a desperate shove, the window creaked open. I shoved myself halfway through, my rifle slung on my back, hindering me. My foot caught on the windowsill and I tumbled out, landing hard on the ground. I scrambled up, ignoring the pain. The cabin, the door was splintering. Wood cracked like gunshots as the creature hammered its way inside. I didn't hesitate. I ran. The forest was a nightmare. I stumbled through the undergrowth, branches tearing at my clothes, my bare feet lacerated from unseen roots and rocks. The creature was behind me, its snarls and the destruction it sowed echoing in the night like something out of a horror movie. I thought of those old stories I used to write, the way fictional characters met their gruesome ends. Never thought it would be my story in the making. Ahead I saw the lights of a road. Salvation. My lungs burned, every muscle in my body screaming, but I forced myself to sprint. If I could just reach the highway, flag down a car. The trees burst open, and I was there. I skidded to a halt at the edge of the pavement, heart pounding a frantic tattoo. A truck was approaching, its headlights blinding in the darkness. Relief washed over me, an almost hysterical wave that left me weak-kneed. I staggered into the road, waving my arms. The truck driver must have seen me, because the brakes squealed, the whole vehicle shuddering to a halt. I ran to the driver's side, fumbling for words, and then the creature came out of the woods. Headlights shone on its grotesque form, freezing it in mid-stride. The truck driver, a burly guy with a bushy mustache, let out a shout that was part curse, part pure fear. I didn't blame him. The sight would turn anyone's blood cold. The creature didn't hesitate. It launched itself at the truck with shocking speed, landing on the hood with a crash that sent glass flying. Metal warped beneath its claws. The driver was screaming now, a high-pitched wail of terror. I watched, transfixed, as the creature turned its attention towards him. Its head snaked towards the side window. I knew I had to do something. I grabbed my rifle, fumbled it off my shoulder and stumbled for a clear shot. Through the shattered window, I saw the creature reaching for the driver, those horrifying teeth inches from his face. I aimed, took a breath I didn't know I was holding, and fired. The recoil slammed against my shoulder, but the creature let out a roar that drowned out the gunshot. I fired again and again. 
blood splattered, and for a moment I hoped. But it didn't fall. The driver was still screaming, still trapped. One more shot, hit it right between its glowing eyes, and finally it went limp, collapsing onto the hood in a heap. The truck door swung open, and the driver fell out, rolling on the asphalt, shouting incoherently. He scrambled back, eyes wild, staring at the creature on his truck. Somehow, I found my voice. Call 911, I yelled, moving towards the truck cautiously. The driver just gaped at me. The creature didn't twitch. I peered through the shattered glass. It wasn't getting up. I'd done it. It was... I wasn't sure if the word was dead, but it wasn't moving. The police came, of course. It was a surreal blur. Flashing lights, questions I couldn't fully answer, paramedics looking over the driver and me. The truck, with the creature still sprawled across it, was impounded. They even tried to take my rifle, but I put my foot down on that, said I had every right to defend myself, or something. They looked at me like I was crazy. The aftermath? Well, that's a longer tale. The cops called it an animal attack, bear or mountain lion gone feral. Nobody believed my story of what the creature asterisk really asterisk looked like. The driver backed me up at first, but then he recanted, said he hadn't seen anything clearly in the shock. Can't say I blame him. They never found a body, though they did find tracks that didn't match anything known. The case went unsolved. I went back to that cabin once, to grab my things, left the same day couldn't shake the feeling I wasn't alone out there. I moved into town after that, a generic apartment with glaring lights and noisy neighbors. Got security cameras, even though I know, deep down, they won't keep things out. Can't look into a shadowy corner without seeing those eyes. Never went back to writing horror. Don't need the inspiration. I write cookbooks now. Recipes, shopping lists, the most mundane topics I can imagine. It helps a little. The nightmares come less often. Sometimes, though, I sit and I stare out my window at the street below, and I think about how that road led right into the woods. How many of asterisks those asterisks could be out there, hiding in the vast forests no one ever truly explores, and how it's only a matter of time before one finds its way into a city, into the harsh light of day, where nobody will believe what they're seeing until it's far too late.'